It was while Jesus was here that he was in the home of Mary and Martha. While there, Martha was busy preparing a meal, but it was Mary who was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his words. And that's when Martha was upset and she wanted Jesus to tell Mary to get in the kitchen and help. But Jesus said Mary had chosen the good part. So I think about that tonight with each one of you. You have taken time out of your day, out of your night, to hear more about the gospel of Christ, to dig into the Word of God. And, and I believe that our Lord would say, you have chosen the good part tonight. It is such a pleasure to be here with you for this series of gospel meetings. You have already showed so much kindness and hospitality to me and my family, and I appreciate that greatly. And uh, appreciate so much the Christophers today and the great meal that they prepared for us. And just to getting to know them and, and each one of you, it is so, so good for us all to be here this week. Our theme is life-changing stories. As we look at various parables that Jesus told while he was here and what they mean as far as how they apply to us and our lives today. Where we can look into these stories and we can say, hey, here's a change that perhaps I need to make. That, that I can glean from these stories and say, well, this is what Jesus meant then and this is what, what it means for me and for my life even today. Tonight we're in Matthew chapter 25. Open your Bibles there, if you will. Matthew chapter 25. We're going to look at this story that happens at a time when most people are asleep. I know that at midnight, I'm, I'm not doing much at midnight if I can make it that long. <laughs> Usually not. Usually it's way before midnight when I'm already asleep. But, but it's interesting to me that when you go to the Scriptures... There's quite a, a few things that happen at midnight. Back in the Old Testament, you'll find in Exodus chapter 11, it was at midnight that God said in that last plague upon the Egyptians as he's helping the people of Israel to escape that Egyptian captivity, what happens? Well, God says it's at midnight that he's going to go through the land of Egypt and all of the firstborn in the land will die. Happened at midnight. Again, you come down through the Old Testament and, and you get over to the time of Samson in the Judges, Judges chapter 16, and it was at midnight, the Bible says, that he's in the city of Gaza. The Gazites were waiting for him. They were going to wait all night and, and decide that they would kill him, but it was at midnight when he decided to leave. And so he gets up and he takes the, the gates of the city, the, the posts, the bars and all with him, throws them on his back, and he, and he carries them miles to Hebron. Happened at midnight. Again, we read about how Ruth, it was at that same time that, that Boaz found Ruth lying at his feet, and they found out that, that he was a near kinsman and able to marry Ruth, Ruth 3, 8 through 11. In the New Testament, you find Paul and Silas, they were in the Philippian jail. They were singing and praying, praising God <clears throat> at midnight, Acts 16 and verse 25. But it's also the time that Jesus uses to tell us to be ready. To be ready for the time that He comes again. In fact, we, you read in Mark chapter 13 and verse 35 where He says, you, you watch, therefore you know not when the master of the house comes. It might be at even, it might be at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning. You, you better watch. And the same thing we have here in this story in Matthew chapter 25. As we lead up to this, we find out in chapter 24 that the disciples are concerned about when the end of time would be. 
And so they questioned Jesus about that in Matthew 24 and verse 3. When, when is going to be the end of the world? When will that happen? And, and he answers them and he makes it clear that yes, he will come back to end the world, but nobody knows exactly when that time is going to be. You look at Matthew 24 and verse 36. He says, of that day and hour knows no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. You read how it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah, how they're eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. They knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You keep reading and you find out in verse 42, Jesus says, watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord does come. Again, you go down in this same passage to verse 44, and you find, Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. You look down in verse 50, The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looks not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of. And it's in the middle of this explanation that Jesus tells us, this story. Friends, it's a story about the church. It's a story about all of us as we have been invited to be a part of a wedding. We've been invited to be a part of this great wedding. The church is the bride of Christ, 2 Corinthians 11, 2. I've espoused you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And we're waiting for the very end, Revelation 19, when, when the marriage supper of the Lamb is finally here. And, and what happens in Revelation chapter 19, you see the, the faithful in their fine linen and, and they're clean and white. And that linen is the righteousness of the saints of God. We've all responded in a positive way. We've obeyed the gospel. We want to see the bridegroom, Jesus himself, like 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, that's our body, we know we have a building of God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Paul said, while we're here in this body, we're absent from the Lord. But what are we willing to do? We're willing to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord, verse 8. That's our desire. That's the desire of every single Christian. And, and we all have our lamps, our, our own personal responsibility as sometimes you were darkness, Ephesians 5, 8 says, but now are you light. And you walk as children of light. And so we have this great light. We have our lamps that we're carrying. But here's something that is different. Some of us are wise, and some of us are foolish. Now, I didn't say that, but Jesus did. And that's what we're finding in this great story, a, a story that I say is a story of preparation. How Jesus tells us this to say one day, it, one day He's going to be revealed and and it's going to be seen as to who, who's prepared and who's not. It ends in a midnight cry, one that none of us can escape. In fact, there are three cries that we're going to examine in this text right here. There is a cry of arrival. There is a cry of agony. There's a cry of rejoicing. All of those are found right here. And we're going to begin with this cry of arrival. It's found... In Matthew chapter 25, verses 3 through 6. Matthew chapter 25, 3 through 6. But let's, let's back up and notice the first part of this. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Then they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps, and while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. 
Now, you've got to understand a Jewish wedding. A Jewish wedding feast was typically held at the groom's house. And it seems to be that these ladies are all waiting there. And that was typically what would happen. The, the wedding party would wait there, and, and these ladies were waiting. In the Jewish custom, the groom would then go to the house of his future father-in-law, and that is where he would find his bride. And so he would get his bride, and he would escort her all the way back to the house, And when he gets back to his house, what happens is the wedding party then comes out with their, with their lamps, their torches or, or lanterns, whatever it it happened to be. And, and so they would come out and they would meet them and then they would all go inside together and rejoice. Well, that's what's happening. That's what these ladies are waiting for. Notice they're, they're there, the, the ladies, there's, Ten of them, five that were foolish and, and five that were wise. But while the bridegroom tarried, they're waiting and they get sleepy. They slumbered and slept. They all had their lamps. They were all waiting, waiting for his arrival. But they, they, they got sleepy. And then all of a sudden at midnight, it seems that this crier comes along and he shouts out and he says, Behold, the bridegroom comes. You need to go out and meet him. And this is, this is wonderful because this is all about Jesus coming again. This is all about what's going to happen at the end, as 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 tells us there, that the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. It reminds me of how the apostles were all watching as Jesus ascended into the heavens, Acts 1 and verse, verses 9 through 11 there, and there were angels who were standing, two of them be, beside them. And they said, you, you men of, of Galilee, why, why are you standing gazing? I can just see them there with their mouths open, wondering what's going on. And, and why are you gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. John wrote that every eye shall see Him, Revelation 1 and verse 7. Friends, it, His return is going to happen. It is not a question of if Jesus will come again. It is a question of when all of this is going to happen. We don't know, and, and we've got to be ready for it. Yourselves know perfectly, Paul said, that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And he says, when you shall say peace and safety, then what happens? Sudden destruction. Like a woman with, with those labor pains. You know that that a woman who is pregnant, you know that that, that baby is going to be delivered at some point, but you don't know when it's going to happen until those, those pains start happening. And Paul says that's how it's going to be. We, we know it's going to happen. We don't know exactly when. But brethren, you're not in darkness, he says, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 4, that that day should overtake you as a thief. And so what does he say there in verse 6? He says, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober, be alert. See, what happens when we get comfortable waiting with whatever preparation it is that, that we have done and we're not aware that the time is near? That's what these ladies did. See, they're all slumbering, they're all sleeping. And so they're not aware. The time is near, but they don't realize all of that. In fact, here in verse 6, here's an important word. When the crier comes, he says, go you out to 
meet him. That word meet is, is a word that's used in reference to meeting or greeting an official dignitary. In our situation, we're talking about our Lord. We're talking about our King. We're talking about our Savior. What do we do? We go out to meet him. These ladies, they were supposed to be shining their lights when the bridegroom came. But five of them didn't take the job very seriously. Friends, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And glorify your Father which is in heaven, Matthew 5 and verse 16. And so I have a, a light, and so do you. It ought to be bright. It ought, it ought to be obvious. And, and we don't want to hide it under anything. Remember, Jesus said, you don't want to take a basket and, and put it over a light. Why would you do that? You don't want to hide it under a bed. Why would you do that? But sometimes we do. Sometimes we can block that that light out. Maybe it is we're afraid. I think there are times that that, that happens with Christians. Sometimes we're afraid. We don't, we, we don't know exactly what to say, exactly what to do, and we encounter folks, and, and we're afraid what they're going to say. But you know what? The, the fearful are going to end up in the lake of fire, Revelation 21.8. Maybe it's because of intimidation from the world. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of wickedness that's out there and, and a lot of attacks against the Lord's church. And sometimes that, that causes us to put our light out. Sometimes it's because of our own immaturity when we ought to be teachers at, at some point, Hebrews 5 and verse 12, but sometimes we don't make it there and we still need milk instead of strong meat. And that's a problem. We, we need to realize that we're focusing upon this light and blocking that light out so that others cannot see. It affects us too not just the people that need the light See, Matthew 13 15 tells us that this people's heart is wax gross and their their ears are dull of hearing their eyes they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them that's where we want to be but but when that light is blocked what happens it causes us to doubt it causes anxiety it causes carelessness unfaithfulness and dare I say unpreparedness This is a story of preparation. One day Jesus will arrive. And how will He find us at that day? There's a cry of arrival, but there's also a cry of rejoicing here. As we read, we find out that all of a sudden, the foolish virgins realize that their flames are going out. Verse 8, when the cry is made, <clears throat> notice all of those virgins arose, all of them trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. And they get up and and hurriedly you can see them as, as they're trimming those wicks and they go in to add more oil, but they don't have enough. And so the wise answered saying, No, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and, and buy for yourselves. So they go to the wise and they say, Hey, won't you, won't you give us some of your oil too? You've got extra there. And maybe you think these wise... These wise ladies are selfish, but they're not. See, it wasn't because of their selfishness. It was because of the fact that every man shall bear his own burden, Galatians 6, 5. In other words, there are some things that I cannot help you with, and you cannot help me with. There, there are some things like dedication. I, I, 
I can't transfer my dedication to the Lord to you. I cannot transfer my character to you. You cannot give that to me. I I cannot transfer my, my faithfulness to you. You cannot transfer that to me. I can't obey the gospel for you. See, it wasn't what the foolish virgins did, but it was what they did not do. See, friends, if all all we have to do for our lamps to go out is nothing. That's it. You leave a fire all by itself, what's going to happen? It's going to go out. All we have to do for those lamps to go out is is nothing. And and that's what these ladies did. They, They didn't stray away from the groom's house, did they? They were still there when he arrived, and, and they were with those other ladies too. So they were there. They, they weren't being defiant in any way. So what was it that happened in this? Why were they foolish and the other ones wise? Because they neglected to plan ahead for the future. They did nothing. And here's the sad part. It is possible. It is possible for someone who is a New Testament Christian to live throughout their entire lives neglecting things that they should be doing and thinking that they're okay all the way throughout their lives until the end. Just like these foolish ladies. I know that James dealt with this very thing. If you want to turn over to James chapter 4, and notice this with me. James chapter 4, you've got James saying there, you need to, to listen to this. You that say today or tomorrow, what are we going to do? We're going to go into such a city. We're going to continue there a year and, and buy and sell and, and get gain. And he says, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Verse 14, it, your life, it's a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. You ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But Now you rejoice in your boastings, and all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him, it is sin. James shows these boasters here. They are... They're bragging to others about how much they have done, and they've done it all without God in their minds. What are they doing? They're leaving God out of their plans. And they're not aware that they needed Him. Not aware that they needed His providence in their lives. And and this principle goes even further. and, And I really don't think that we treat it as seriously as we should. One man translated it this way, if a man knows that a thing is wrong and he continues to do it, then it's sin. Well, I I think it goes further than that. The truth is, when a man does wrong, whether he knows it or not, it's still wrong. Acts 17, 30 and 31, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now He commands all men everywhere to repent. Not everybody knows that. That's why we've got to get the message out there and tell people, hey, you, you've got to change your life. You've got to be prepared. James deals with neglect. We might even say uselessness where we know what we ought to do, but for whatever reason it is, we don't do it. And we can fall into the trap of thinking, you know, I haven't committed this sin. I'm not as bad as this person. I haven't done this or that. And what is it that Maybe we've neglected in our lives. Friends, these these ladies who were foolish were unprepared. And the wise said, hey, you need to go buy your own oil. We've got ours all. We prepared. You, you go out and, and you go buy for yourselves, verse 9. And while they went to buy, notice this, verse 10. The bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was 
shut. Now, they're told to go by for themselves. Now, shops are not typically open at, at midnight. But in a small Jewish town, when there was a big wedding celebration going on, sometimes those shop owners would stay open because it was a, a celebration that everybody enjoyed. And so this is not unfeasible here. This is something, yes, they could have gone, but, but what happens while they're gone... They missed him. While they're gone, the bridegroom came. Everything that these ladies had been waiting for had finally happened. And the ones who were ready, what happened? There had to be rejoicing. They've been waiting probably for months for this to celebrate this wonderful occasion. And they've been waiting all night. They got so tired. That, but now there's excitement that the bridegroom is there. And they all go in who are ready, verse 10. They go in with him to the marriage. And look at this. The door was shut. They're inside where there is security. There are blessings. There is happiness. Don't you say there has to be rejoicing for these ladies? See, John, John described for us how, how wonderful heaven is. Revelation chapter 21, in fact, he said it's like a bride adorned for her husband. Think about that. Men, you know how that is. Those of you who are married, you know what it was like on your wedding day when you're standing at the front and you get the first glimpse of your bride in the back as she starts down the aisle and, and you see how her hair is all done and, and her makeup is done and everything is just right. And there's rejoicing. That's how John says... Heaven will be where there's purity and, and there's joy because everything is different there. Revelation chapter 21, where we learn that, yes, we'll be in the very presence of our God. He says, I, I heard a great voice out of heaven, verse 3, saying, the tabernacle of God is with men. They're, they're just like just like it was in the Old Testament when, when they had the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant and it, and it was God's presence there that between the cherubim, Psalm 80 and verse 1, on the mercy seat. And, and He'll personally be with us in heaven. And look at how close you'll be. Revelation 21.4, God shall wipe away all tears. From their eyes there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Every single sad tear that you have ever shed won't be there. And most of the sad tears that we shed happens because of death. And what we learn is that's not going to be there either. There's not going to be any sorrow. There's not going to be any more pain. And we, we get to be there in all of its glory and, and with all of the beauty and, and the rejoicing that is there. You think about that's what those ladies represented. Those who were ready, they got to go in. And the door was shut. And, and John tells us, here's what we get to experience too. And, and there's all kinds of rejoicing because of this peace. And there's no separation. There is no sin. There's no more slips of weakness I have slips of weakness and so do you but we don't have that we won't have that in heaven see when lust conceives it brings forth sin sin when it's finished it brings forth death James 1 15 and 16 we we don't see that there 
In heaven, John says, this is all about security. This is about, this is about rejoicing where you realize, yes, you're surrounded by this wall that's great and high. There's absolute security according to verse 12. And there's no threat from the outside. And when you look at it, there's, the gates of it shall not be shut at all. By day there shall be no night there. And we realize that the angels are rejoicing with the saved, probably welcoming us into heaven heaven and there is nothing there that ever will defile us revelation 21 and verse 27 and you never have to leave in fact what paul said was that when jesus comes again and and we that are alive and remain we we can be caught up together with them in the clouds. And what happens? We meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. You never have to leave. And so he says, comfort one another with these words. There's rejoicing here. Because these ladies were prepared... And at the end of time, if we are just as prepared, there will also be rejoicing. But I want you to see the flip side too. Because there's also a cry of agony. As we come down to verses 11 and 12, notice that afterward came also the other virgins. They've been away trying to buy more oil for themselves. And while they were away, those who were wise, they got to go in with the bridegroom into this wonderful wedding feast where there was rejoicing and security. But now for these who were gone, there's nothing but hopelessness and despair. In fact, when this when this text says that the door was shut, the Greek indicates that it was shut to stay that way. It would never be open again. Somebody said the wedding bell has now turned into the funeral knell. You think about that. And they said, Lord... Lord, open to us. But he answered and he said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. No matter how much pleading that these ladies did for this groom to open up the door, the door was not going to open. It would stay shut. They could hear him saying from the other side of the door, I'm not going to have anything to do with you. I don't know you. Because they weren't prepared, they would face permanent consequences. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment, that's it. Hebrews 9.27, it, it's what Jesus said, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and they shall not be able. When once, he says, the master of the house is risen up, and what does he do? He shuts the door, and you begin to stand without, and, and to knock on the door and say, Lord, open to us. And he'll say, I know not who you are. Luke 13, 24 and 25. Friends, when some, for some people, the coming of the Lord will be too late. In other words, if only He had just come when, when they were first baptized and, and they came up out of the waters of baptism as fresh and clean, a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5.17, and rejoicing, if only He had come then, if only He could come while they were still zealous and, and full of faith and good works, if only He could come before some people become an indifferent to the work of our Lord. The challenge is, right here in verse 13, to watch. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. 
I might add to that, watch therefore with extra oil. With dedication and and faithful and obedient and godly life. Why? Jesus is there and He's standing at the door. He's he's knocking as Revelation 3.20 points out. And guess what? There's not a knob on His side. It's only on ours. We have to open the door before it's shut for good. Jesus said, not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, Matthew seven twenty one. Oh, I know many will say to me in that day, Lord, have, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out demons, and in thy name have done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Friends, I, I don't want to be standing behind a closed door because I could not get along with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Because I didn't reconcile that, that relationship. Matthew 5.24 tells me I've got to do that. I don't want to be standing behind a closed door because I've allowed bitterness and I've allowed anger and, and evil speaking to invade my life when I'm supposed to put all of that behind me, Ephesians 4.31 and 32. I don't want to be standing behind a closed door because I have failed to obey my Lord. It's a story of preparation for all of us. There was an article in the Harvard Business Review one time that talked about how a lot of folks didn't understand what kind of business they were in in the past. You think about all of the railroad systems across our country and and the railroad business and and back in, in those days, Those folks, they thought they were in the railroad business. They didn't realize they were in the transportation business. If they had realized they were in the transportation business, then they would have bought into airplanes. They would have bought into automobiles. They didn't do that. Those in the telegraph business didn't understand what kind of business they were in. They, they, they didn't know it was the communication business that it was all about. And, and they could have, in 1886, they could have bought a patent for all of the telephones. They didn't do that. And so that business died. But what about us? kind of business are you in? We're not in the church business. That's not what this is. We're in the soul saving business. We're in the preparation for eternity business. That's that's what we ought to be about. That is our goal. That is our business. And we have to understand that. That is exactly what the Lord wants us to do as we go out into the world and and preach the gospel to every creature and and realize that this is the soul-saving business. Our soul first and, and then everybody else. Think about it. And the time for us to prepare is right now. God gives us all kinds of opportunities. Every sermon that you hear is another opportunity. Every passage that you read in the Scriptures is another opportunity. Every Bible study lesson that that you go over is another opportunity. It's out there every single day. God wants you to be saved, 1 Timothy 2.4. And so do we. That's why He's given us a plan. That's why He demonstrated His love toward us. Now, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. Will you make yourself ready? 
The Bible teaches us how. It, it's very simple. First off, through our faith, Romans 10, 17. We want to repent. We want to change our lives when we realize what our Lord has done for us, 2 Corinthians 7, 10. We, we then confess Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, so that He'll confess us, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. We want to be baptized. Why? It's required. Baptism doth also now save us, 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. And, and what happens? We're buried with Him in baptism, and we come up to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 3 and 4. That makes us saved. At that moment, we're prepared, but we have to continue in our faithfulness, our steadfastness to Him unto death, Revelation 2.10. That's when we get the crown of life. That's when there is rejoicing as we go into that marriage supper of the Lamb. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, you have the opportunity tonight. Don't wait. Well, together we stand and we sing.